Ammonia, as you know, is a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen with the formula of NH3. It's made of three hydrogen atoms and one nitrogen atom that gives us the ammonia molecule that looks like this. Ammonia is a colorless gas with a bit of spicy odor. It's lighter than air and spelled 58.9% than as air. It is moderately basic, has a pH of 11.6. Ammonia is considered a high health safe hazard because it's corrosive to the skin, eyes, and lungs. Exposure to 300 parts per million is immediately dangerous to life and health. However, household ammonia is a solution of ammonia in water, so it's mild and it's diluted. Ammonia has a boiling point of negative 33.34 degrees Celsius, so it must be kept at low temperature or at high pressure. And it has a melting point of negative 77.7 .7 degrees Celsius. The ammonia molecule has a trigonal pyramidal shape. The central atom, which is the nitrogen atom, has five valence electrons with additional electrons from each of the hydrogen atoms. Three of these Electron pairs are used as bond pairs, which leaves one lone electron pair that repel more strongly than a bond pair. The nitrogen atom in this molecule has this bond pair, which makes ammonia a base, a proton acceptor, because it's slightly negative this way. This shape gives ammonia a dipole moment and makes it polar. Because of this molecule's polarity and its ability to form hydrogen bonds, it makes ammonia high miscible with water. As we learned in a chapter 8.1, to be miscible with water means any amount of ammonia dissolves in any amount of water. As of 2004, about 83% of ammonia is used as fertilizers. Ammonia is also used as cleaners. Household ammonia, as I mentioned before, is a solution of ammonia in water. Because ammonia results in a relatively strike-free shine, it's often used to clean gas porcelain and stainless steel. It is also frequently used to clean ovens and to loosen baked donut bread. The hopper process, which I'll talk about later, produces 1 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer per year, mostly in the form of anhydrous ammonia or ammonium nitrate. The fertilizer is responsible for sustaining one third of our world's population. There are 11 ammonia plants located across Canada. As you can see, half of them are located here in Alberta, and we do have one located here in Ontario, too. These ammonia plants are responsible for producing 4 to 5 million tons of ammonia per year. 25% produce is directly shipped to North American markets for direct use. About 55% is produced is used for production in oral granular fertilizer, and about 20% is needed in nitrogen fertilizers. The harbor process needs carbon in the natural gas during the gas synthesis production. The plant's carbon dioxide removal system strips off the carbon dioxide during gas stream reforming because uh, to avoid contamination of the ammonia synthesis catalyst. This relatively pure carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, so it's very harmful for our environment. Many facilities use part or all of the process generated carbon dioxide for euro production. This is a great benefit to us because it reduces the amount of process produced carbon dioxide emitted to the atmosphere. Canada is really unique in that each of our ammonia plant is situated close to Europe plant, so that Canadian ammonia plants recover a higher percentage of their success generated carbon dioxide emission than do producers in other countries. Here is a graph that shows Canada ammonia production from 2003 to 2007. As you can see, there has been significant increase from 2003 to 2004. Here's a picture of household ammonia. On the left is ammonia in water, as I mentioned before, and that's ammonia in salt form. There are other ways to convert nitrogen into ammonia, and the natural way to do that is through nitrogen fixation. Natural occurrence of ammonia is found in trace quantities in the atmosphere. In other words, only a small enough 
quantities is found in the atmosphere. And these are produced from the decay process of nitrogenous animal and vegetable matter. Ammonia and ammonium are also found in trace quantities in seawater, rainwater, and all fertile soil. So gaseous ammonia was first isolated by Joseph Priestley in 1774. The synthesis production has been studied as early as 1840. The only ones it studied from the standpoint of thermodynamics principle was it found to be commercially practical. So early in the 20th century, several chemists tried but failed to produce ammonia. The technical problems they have encountered were first solved by Fritz Harper and Carl Bosk. They demonstrated their success first in the summer of 1909. They were producing ammonia at the rate of a cup every two hours. Then they were awarded Nobel Prizes. Fritz Harper was awarded in 1918 and Harald Bosch was awarded in 1931. Ammonia was then first produced on an industrial scale by the Germany during World War I. Before the Harper process production of ammonia was invented, most ammonia was obtained by dry distillation of nitrogenous vegetable and animal waste, animal waste products, where it was distilled by the reduction of nitrous acid and nitrates by hydrogen. Ammonia was also produced by dry distillation of coal and by the decomposition of ammonium salts by alkaline hydroxides. Now we'll get into the more technical side of this process. Because ammonia is widely needed, it is one of the most frequently produced inorganic chemicals. Here you can see is ammonia plant back in the old days, compared to what we have right now. And here is ammonia plant located in Malaysia. This process is important because before it was discovered by Harvard, Ammonia has been difficult to produce on an industrial scale. It's estimated that half of the protein within us are made of nitrogen that were once fixed by this process. By far, the major source of hydrogen needed for this process is obtained through methane by natural gas. There are other ways to obtain hydrogen needed for this process. However, the sources of hydrogen makes no difference to the process, which is only concerned with synthesizing ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen. So the ammonia production through Harvard process is first, sulfur oxide and hydrogen sulfide is removed from the methane. Then the clean methane is reacted over a catalyst of nickel oxide, which gives us this equation. So methane water gives us carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. The secondary reforming happens when additional air of methane is needed to recover the that did not react during the first process. So here you can see that more oxygen is reacted with methane to produce ammonia, uh, to produce carbon dioxide and water. Then the water gas shift reaction yields more hydrogen from carbon monoxide and steam. So carbon monoxide and water gives us carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. Then the gas mixture is now passing to a methaneer, which converts the most of the remaining carbon monoxide into methane for recycling. So carbon monoxide, hydrogen gives us more ammonia and water. Then the last stage, which is the actual harbor process, is the synthesis ammonia using iron catalyst promoted with 
potassium oxide, calcium oxide, and aluminum oxide, which gives us this equation. So nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas, ammonia. This process is done at 15 to 25 megapascals and between a temperature of 300 to 550 degrees Celsius. It passes the gas over four beds of catalyst, which uh, with cooling in between them to maintain an equivalent constant. To summarize the Harvard process, is that methane is passed through the sulfur removal, which is gone through the secondary performer. Then carbon dioxide is removed from the system to avoid contamination of the ammonia synthesis catalyst. Then it's gone through a methaneator to recycle for methane. Then over all these complex stages, it gives us ammonia from ammonia converter. So to end this presentation with something interesting and historically relevant, is that the Harvard process is an example of complex impact of chemistry upon life. At the start of World War I, Germany was dependent upon the natural nitrate deposit of Chile for its nitrogen needed for, to manufacture explosives. The alley blockade of the South American ports soon cut off the supply. If it wasn't for the Harvard process for the alternative source of nitrogen, Germany would have likely to be forced to surround it years before 1918. By prolonging the war, the harbor process indirectly caused thousands of lives. However, over the years, the fertilizer produced by this very same process has increased crop yields around the globe and has spared millions of lives from hunger.